This video is brought to you by Sailrite. Visit sailrite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this video tutorial, we're going to show you how to make a sunshade that is temporary. And what I mean by temporary is you can easily install it and remove it when it's not in use, and then reinstall it and remove it. So whenever you're having a party or a gathering or a meal and the sun's beating down on you, you can install this sunshade quickly and easily, and it also looks great. This tutorial video will show you how to install all the hardware and also how to sew up the shade. After mounting all the hardware and sewing up your sunshade, you'll find that you can install and remove this sunshade in about two minutes. Next, we'll discuss the application on our patio and we'll also discuss temporary versus permanent sunshades. We need to provide some shade for this patio area. Depending on the time of the year and the time of the day, the sun beats down on this and it's just miserable having any kind of meal out here or get together. So we're going to provide some shade. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use carby poles. We have one pole mounted here and one on the other side. And then we're going to attach to the house a eye bolt here, which we've already installed into the uh, stud behind the vinyl siding. You may be asking, why not just install a permanent sail shade or sun shade? And you can do that, but there's a little bit more labor involved. To install a permanent sunshade or sail shade, you would have to use a 4x4 post or a 6x6 post or a steel post, and you'd have to dig a hole and have a footer, usually concrete. So the labor is a little bit more intensive, but by installing a permanent post like that, you can use turnbuckles on the sail shade and draw it up tightly. So you could use it all year round. Now, if you have a lot of snow, you obviously want to take it down in the wintertime because you wouldn't want snow to stack on top of your sail shade, and you probably wouldn't be using it then anyway. But if you wanted to leave it up all summer, you'd have to install posts at the corners and use turnbuckles. For us, we're using the carbon fiber carby pole, and that means that it's a temporary sail shade to be installed when you want it and removed when you don't. These are carbon fiber poles that are very light yet very strong and they have an adjustable cam lock in the middle here so that you can adjust the height. Now they also have on the pole a uh, line that runs through the middle that's adjusted via a cam cleat here and there is a block and pulley system up here so you can tension your sail shade by hand. Here you see we tighten the rope at the bottom of the carpet pole and the sun shade tightens up. And then on the opposite side, there is a pad eye. So if it were under a lot of pressure, you could actually put a strap on it, an adjustable strap, and affix it to something solid. When you're done making your shade, how long does it take to install the shade and remove it? Let's show a clip of that in double time. We've installed our carby poles into the receiver. Now we find the correct corner of our sail shade and attach it to the snap hook on the line of the carby pole. We do the same thing with the second corner. Then on the side of the house, we go to the corner and grab the snap hook and attach it to the eye bolt on the house. Then the last corner, following the same procedure. Then to tension the sunshade, we go to the carby poles and pull on the line and cleat it. And now your sunshade is installed in a minute and 16 seconds. Let's get started with the tutorial. The first step is to install the hardware. We have vinyl siding and we need to install an eye bolt. We're going to show you how to temporarily remove the vinyl siding to find a stud. This is a siding uh, removal tool. It has a little hook on the edge uh, that makes it easy to remove vinyl siding if that's what your house or structure is made from. Uh, Sayrite doesn't sell these, but again, any hardware store, good hardware store, will have these. Okay, if you have vinyl siding, you'll notice that there's a crack underneath where these, uh, the J clip actually clicks under another clip here. Here, underneath here, there's no seam. So we can separate this panel if we want to put our eye bolt someplace in here, which I think I do. This seems a little bit low, even though I could reach this a little bit easier. It just seems like the shade will be right on top of your head when you come out the door. So I'm going to try to put it right up here. So you can see the joint here. I'm going to take my tool and get it pretty close to that area. And I'm going to insert it in the bottom here and lift up. Oh, 
like that. Okay, so now you got to be careful. If the vinyl's old, you don't want to crack it, so you got to do this gently. So I'm going to pull down on the tool and pry up a little bit to try to get that J clip out. There it's, it's out, and I'm going to pop it out a little bit further. There we go. So now you can see I have access to the underside. Now I don't really want to take down this panel completely. I can clip it back in if I'm careful and I don't ruin it. So now I'm going to come down the length here just like this and unclip it to the point where I want to put the eye in. I'm going to undo a little bit more. All kinds of stuff coming out. So I have a drill with just probably an eighth inch drill bit. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to drill through, not the vinyl siding, but the substrate underneath it, because nobody's going to see these holes. And then once I find the location, then I'll drill through the vinyl siding. So I'm going to try it right about here. Oh, so all we have right here is just the uh, outer board, which is not good enough. So I'm going to try another spot. I'm just going to keep doing this until I find a stud. There will be a stud someplace in this, and I want it to be fairly close to the edge. Might be right where that nail is, but I doubt it. I'm sure you're making fun of me. The red line probably indicates where the stud is. Right there. Yep, it does. So right where that uh, mark was, and maybe that was intentional. This is the decision time because we're going to drill a hole in the vinyl siding and nobody likes to do that. Um, hopefully you're okay with this. If not, then you need to come up with a different system. We're going to drill a hole, a small hole first, right where we know that stud is, which is right there. And I'm gonna come down just a little bit and put it right here. Okay, we have the location where we want to install the eye and I'm gonna drill a bigger hole, but let's put this vinyl siding back on. So I'm gonna take my tool basically to the end where it, it starts to unclip and I'm gonna pull it down and push it into the J-clip underneath. There, you'll hear it lock in place. And just do this all the way down the length. So I can see my hole down in there on that end, and it is in, it's in this piece of vinyl siding. So this is what I want to remove. But my seams are way over there and way over there. So I'm going to start in the middle, which I didn't do there at the beginning, and insert my tool here. And I'm going to pry this out, because you can do this from the middle too. And we just need enough room that we can gain access to the underneath and find our stud and do the same thing here. A Sayrite has a, uh, a turned lag eye bolt 5 16 by 3 inch that's really perfect for these applications and I'm going to use the 7 seconds inch drill bit. If you put the drill bit behind your lag eye and you can see the threads on the side then you know it's a perfect size. So this is our hole, our pre-drilled hole. This will make it a little bit bigger, and we're going to drill into the surface underneath, into the stud. Okay, if you know anything about vinyl, vinyl has a tendency to expand and shrink based on the temperature outside and how much sun it gets. So typically, you want a hole that's a little bit bigger than the actual lag itself, only in the vinyl. Now, this is not a huge hole because you obviously don't want to such a big hole that, um, that it can cause excessive leaking. So all I'm gonna do is make a hole in the vinyl a little bit bigger so that I could have a little bit of expansion. And you can see it's not much bigger. You may wanna go bigger, but I don't have a problem with a little bit of a bubble here. And now I'm just gonna screw it in. When, I, when it gets difficult to screw all the way, I will use a screwdriver and use it because it's getting hard already. Boy, that makes it easy. 
I'm going to go till the threads are just buried right there and I'm going to make it level for me. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, this base, if it's level with a surface, you can see this is canted back here. Now, if I take the button and push on it and push the receiver out, and if I turn it 180 degrees, and put it in, and it locks with the button. It's now canted back this direction. So the question for you that are mounting this is, do you want the horseshoe shape to be pointing in or pointing out? Okay, because you really want this to always cant away from the center of your shade. Okay, so the center of our shade will be basically a 45 degree angle here. I think for my application that mounting it like this so that the horseshoe is facing in towards the middle of the shade will look better than the horseshoe facing out. There's just a lot of gear here. This is preference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount it like this. And the best way to do this is you don't even have to have this in here because this can be flipped 180 degree. You just want this from the button to the middle of the horseshoe or the U to be pointing towards the center of your sail shade, whether it be like this or like this. The button requires an access hole. So if I flip this upside down, we need to drill a hole for this location and you can see here that this spade bit three quarter inch is perfect. It'll give me a perfect hole for the button to operate because when you push on the button you can see the spring action here. So we need to allow that to move. Now what I could do is I could make a wooden base. Okay if I didn't want to drill a big hole into my deck uh, I could make a wooden base here, a round base or a square base and then I could have it operate through the base and just screw the base into the deck surface. But for me, I don't care about putting a huge hole in this. If I didn't like the, the hole, if I, went, if I took this off in a future date, I could actually just put some wood putty in there. And then since I used a solid color stain, I could stain right over it and nobody would be able to tell uh, that there was a huge hole here. So again, I'm gonna mount it like this. This is basically the center of my sail shade like that. It doesn't have to be exact, it just needs to be approximately the center of the shade. And that means that I need to put this hole at about that location. So I'm going to make an indent in there. Okay. So now I'm going to drill a hole that's deep enough to accept this. That might do it. Let's test it. Yep, got to go further. Perfect. Right there. Now we can still pivot this around a little bit to get a little bit of adjustment. I haven't screwed this down yet. I'm going to put the receiver in here and then I'm going to look that, yep, that's basically pointing towards where the center of the shade will be. So I'm going to remove the receiver and then I'm going to use screws for our deck to install this. So Carby Pole has five holes. I only need to probably use four of them, not five. So I'm just going to use the outer four holes and I'm going to use some deck screws and I'm not even going to pre-drill holes. There we go. If you don't want to drill a three-quarter inch hole for the button, what you can do is make a puck like I've done here out of uh, some treated lumber. 
So basically I, I have a puck the same size as the base as far as being round. It could be square as well. And then I drilled my three quarter inch hole through this and it actually went through the bottom so water could leak out, a, a wick hole. And then what I would do is mount this on top and then screw with long deck screws and screw through the base, the puck, and into the deck wherever I'd like it positioned. Some of these bases, if you flip it, the button may not come up. In other words, the button may not be allowed to come up because the tolerances are fairly tight. That's not always the case for all of them. But if you ever find that to be the issue, all you need to do is remove the receiver and then use a Dremel tool with a stone on it. Now, I wouldn't use anything that's metallic because uh, metal metallic uh, ab abrasion systems will leave uh, residue on this and then the stainless steel will rust where the residue is left. But if you use a stone like this, you can uh, put safety goggles on and then you can polish some of the stainless steel because it won't, uh, won't hurt it at all until the button pops up. So this may be required if you want to flip it so that the angle's different. As you can see, it's starting to polish some of it off already, but it may not be required. If you need to do that, just use a Dremel tool with a stone. Now that the hardware is installed, it's time to measure for the sunshade. That's next. We want to measure the four outside edges, and then we want to measure diagonally from both corners. So right through the center. So our first measurement against the house is 159 from eye bolt to eye bolt. We'll write that down. So from the structure to the top of this pole is 152. And then across from that one to this, we get 151. Okay, so I have a second helper here and she's gonna measure from the attachment point on this end and then I'm gonna run it across diagonally to the top of the carby pole at where we believe the top mounting position would be. So I have it extended all the way to where I'd like it mounted at the highest point. But for us, I think this is where we want it. And we'll get a measurement of, and I get 232 inches diagonally. We'll write that down. Okay, so we have our measurements uh, from uh, mounting position to mounting position, and we have the diagonal. This is a four-sided. Uh, shade, you may have a three-sided. Uh, we need to reduce the size. For one, the poles are going to flex a little bit inward. Okay, the carby pole is facing so that this block is kind of facing right to the middle of the sail shade, which is what we want. And you notice the pole is uh, not under any tension right now, so it's way out here. But watch what happens to the end of the pole when I start putting tension onto the sail shade. See it flexing in? That is one of the reasons why we need to make sure that we create eight to 10% reduction in the sail shade because the poles are typically out here and they flex in almost five to six inches, depending on how much tension you put on the pole. It's now time to pattern or loft the sunshade. So we're gonna reduce it in size, each one of these measurements by a percentage. And what we found to work well is 8% to 10%. We don't want anything bigger than that. I'm going to use 10%. So I'm going to take 151 times 0.9, and that gives us 135.9. And that is the measurement that we will use. So I'm going to do that with all these uh, calculations, including the diagonal. 232 times 0.9 which is 10% less, is 208.8. We'll probably round up or down um, because we aren't concerned that much about fractions. And we'll do this all for all the measurements. We're using an HDPE fabric that's seven ounce and it's 150 inches wide. So we can't lay it this direction uh, width wise because it's 164, but we can this direction, which means all I need to do is take the 164.7, 164.7 and divide that by 36 to get yardage. 
So I need 4.57 yards. I'll order five yards. Now we'll lay our fabric on our driveway because we need a fairly large space and we can start our measurements. Okay, now I have five tape measures, which makes this job a little bit easier. You may only have one. And if you have that, you'll have to mark corners with some chalk and then use that tape measure for other sides. But when you have five tape measures like I do, so you may wanna borrow some from your neighbor, you can easily measure each one of the sides and also the diagonal. Now this is my house side, so you need to make sure that you know which side is the house side. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the diagonal. What I like to do with the tape measures is I like to look at my measurements on my paper. This one's uh, 208.8, and I like to set my tape, tape, tape measure right at 208.8 and then lock it in place. So I know that's my measurement and I don't have to really think about that again. Then I can make adjustments to all my other tape measures based on this diagonal. So this is my last measurement. And you need to make sure that it is set at the uh, measurement you did on the house. If I remember right, this is the house, which it is. I wrote down on the paper. So this is my last measurement. And then I'll adjust tape measures until all the measurements are what I have written down. So all my measurements are now accurate. I've adjusted everything. And again, we're not very concerned about fractions. I'm just rounding. So I'm gonna put a mark at each one of the four corners uh, where they should go with my chalk. So a little dot, and we'll do that at all four of the corners. Okay, this one's 164.7. There we go. So every one of the sides of the sail shade, all four for us, if yours is a three side, all three for yours, needs to have a hollow. And what a hollow is, is it's a curve inward like this. What that hollow does is it helps to support the edge to keep it from fluttering, and it also helps to draw tension into the center. And what we like to use for a temporary sunshade uh, is 10%. Okay, I know that's a lot. We're gonna take away 10% of each one of the links of all four of the sides, but that is really what's best when you get a, have a sail shade that is not tensioned with a turnbuckle. So again, 164.7 um, uh, times uh, 10. Uh, point 0.1. <laughs> I had to think there for a minute. 16.47. So I'm going to write that in the middle here. Now we don't really need a calculator for this uh, because it's 10%. So this one we know is going to be 14.3 uh, and this one's going to be 13.5. Okay, so this is the hollow for each one of the sides. So I went to the hardware store and I got some uh, PVC pipe, a half inch, and a coupler. Uh, that way I can extend the length of it. And I'm not going to glue it, I'm just going to put it in the coupler. This is, makes great device to create hollow. Okay, the first step is to put it on your marks at the corner and then keep the pipe straight. So I'm going to put it right on the, the mark that we made right there. And I'm going to make sure the pipe looks nice and straight. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be fairly straight here. So at the approximate center location, which is here, for us with the pipe straight, I'm just gonna put a line here with my chalk, which will easily come up later. And then for this side, we need 16.47. Um, I'm just gonna go 16. So I'm gonna put my tape measure at 16 right there, and I'm gonna put a mark here. Okay, so that is where we want this pipe to flex into. And I need to get my weight here. So I'm gonna flex the pipe into that point, and then I'm gonna put a weight on it. Okay, so there's my, the point that I want it to be at. I'm gonna keep it like that, and then I'm gonna make sure that the sides are right on the point, which they're not. So I'm gonna fix those. Like that. And like that. Now, what you wanna do is you wanna sight down the pipe 
and make sure that it looks good. And it does. It looks like the hollow is right in the center of that. I'm not measuring to find the center. I'm just looking for something that looks pleasing to the eye. If it didn't, I'd make adjustments. Now, what I want to do is I want to mark with my chalk right along the side of the pipe. So using those 10% calculations for a hollow that we showed earlier, we take that 10% of the side that we're uh, adding the hollow to, 10% of the length, and at the center position of that side, we curve our pipe in to the percentage that we calculated, and then we strike a line along it. And we do that with all the sides of our sunshade. All right, and we'll do that with all the other three sides. Now, this is the house side, and this is the upside of the fabric. Is there a right side and a wrong side to the fabric? R not really, but once you have your pattern marked on it, you need to make sure that you know which is the upside based on your measurements, because uh, we don't have a perfectly square uh, pattern here. So if, if we get it mixed up and have the downside, then each side would be off. So I'm gonna mark H on this side and up on this side. Now I'm marking this not with my um, chalk. I'm marking it with a scryball pencil here because the chalk comes off so easily. We want this to be on here rather permanently uh, and very close to the edge that we're gonna um, hem later on, which is this curved edge. So H and UP. While I was marking the fabric to the correct size, my daughter, Mercy, and my grandson, Ezra, came out to visit. They're both so cute. Ezra is completely enamored by the drone. Now that it's lofted or patterned, it's time to cut it out. We have two hot knives here that we're going to demonstrate. One of them is uh, the edge hot knife that you plug in with a regular plug into the wall, and the other one is a battery-operated uh, edge hot knife. And on the bottom side of our uh, surface, we have uh, the tempered uh, cutting glass for hot knife that's available from Sayorite so that you do not damage the surface that you're working on. But what happens when you use a hot knife, so I'll push on the trigger here, and what happens when you use a hot knife on this HDPE fabric is it, it kind of helps to seal the edge. But you don't really have to use a hot knife. You could use scissors because we are going to create a double hem around the perimeter. Now, if you weren't creating a double hem and you chose only to create a single hem, then using a hot knife is rather important because the edge needs to be sealed so it looks better. Now let's demonstrate the cordless hot knife. I love this hot knife because I'm not tethered by a cord. I'm going to move my cutting glass and I'm just going to start to cut from this end over here where the edge of the cutting glass is. I just hold the, press this button here, that's the safety, and then press the trigger and cut. This one heats up right away and it cools down in about that same uh, minute time or less. And now I don't have to worry about a cord. Beautiful. So we're going to just cut around the entire perimeter on the lines that we made with the chalk and we'll come back to how we hem it. Next, we're going to create hems and corner patches for reinforcement. So this is my sail shade and you can see the house side and where I marked up is facing the table top. So we're going to go to one of the corners and cut out corner patches. To do this, I have some scrap fabric on the table and what I'll do is uh, just hold my patch material down over that scrap fabric, leaving about uh, 14 inches or so of fabric down each leg. And then I will use uh, my scryball black um, pencil and mark right along the side of the sail shade uh, because each one of these corners is a slightly different shape. So we'll do this for all four of the uh, corners. Once that's done, I'm going to take the Sayerat Canvas Patterning Ruler, I'm going to place an awl in the small hole at the top here, and then go down to the furthest hole, and I'm going to use it to create a nice curve at the bottom of this patch assembly. Now, if you don't have the Canvas Patterning Ruler, you can just take a pencil on a string or a compass. We basically want each leg to be approximately 8, 9, 10 inches. It doesn't need to be any bigger than that. 
So this is the corner to keep from getting confused. We're going to label it A and this one A. Then we're going to take our hot knife and cut this out. Now I do recommend using a hot knife on this arch down here. If you don't have a professional hot knife like the Serrate Edge hot knife, you can use a wood burning tool or a soldering gun to uh, do this uh, same procedure. Now we'll do that with all four of the corners. Okay, we have the underside of the sail sticking up. Is there an underside, a right side and a wrong side to this material? Not really. Uh, but uh, we know that we patterned it so that this side is the underside and the side facing the sun is facing the tabletop. So that's the, what, what you want to do at home as well. We're going to use uh, seam stick basting tape for canvas and we're going to apply it very close to the raw edge all along this side. I'm going to reposition the sail shade on my tabletop. And this is the way I like to apply the double-sided tape because it's much faster. So I'll come down here and I will take my seam stick. And now, since I'm working with the sail right above me, I can easily apply the double-sided tape very quickly like this. And then when I get to the bottom edge where it's off the table, I'll just put my double-sided tape down and then I'll move the sail to the next position. So you can do this pretty easily with a small table like this. And it does make pretty quick work, actually. So again, we're putting it very close to that raw edge. Okay, so we have it down this one uh, side. I'm going to peel off the transfer paper and uh, base this side. Now we're going to create a double hem. You don't have to create a double hem. It could be a single hem if you'd like. But uh, we think it just looks better. So I'm going to peel off the double-sided tape. And then I'm going to baste it over. Now, I'm not going to measure anything. I mean, you can if you want, but I'm going to um, basically fold it over to about a half inch. So I have a half inch of fabric uh, showing. And I'm going to do this down the whole length. You can see that double-sided tape sticks really well with this HDPE fabric. And if you're off, you, like this looks like a little bit more than a half inch, you could always peel it up and rebaste it. So this is what it would look like if you had uh, left it a single hem. Then you just take it to the sewing machine and you'd sew a straight stitch very close or a zigzag stitch very close to this raw edge. But we're going to do a double hem. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply double sided tape very close to this raw edge. And one of the reasons that we apply the double sided tape close to the raw edge is that when this is folded back, then we're going to be sewing through here. And there is no double sided tape because this fabric is not there is a mesh fabric. Sometimes it can build up uh, goo from the double-sided tape. So we're going to sew outside of the double-sided tape uh, right into here and there'll be no goo on our needle. We'll now peel off the transfer paper to this and then we'll fold it back to create our double hem. Now it's true we have to put a patch in here but we can always peel that back up to put the patch in after we're done with all four of the corners. So don't worry about that for right now. Now we're going to use the Serac Canvas Patterning Ruler with my finger on the metal part here and just apply pressure down on it just to adhere that basting tape well to the, to the HDPE fabric. Because we're going to do a hem on all four sides, this double sided tape is not meant to be permanent so it may come unstuck and doing this basically helps to prevent that from happening. Okay, so we're just going to move down and do the next side. Now, before we sew anything, we need to put those patches in. So after I get all the sides hemmed, either with our single hem or double hem, we're doing a double hem, we'll show you how to do the patches. Now, this is the side of the house. It's, the H is under my hem here, and the up is actually this side, uh, even though it folded over to the here. But we want to be able to quickly identify which side of the shade is what. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick a Sayerite tag 
on the side that's up to the house. That way I never have to get confused about what side is what when I'm putting the shade up quickly. So I'm going to put some double sided tape on this tag and I'm going to stick it right underneath this hem. So I put it on the inside and the outside just so it doesn't move on me. And this is approximately the center location. So when I sew, this will sew this tag in and I always know this is the house side. Okay, this is our patch and it's going to go on, this is A. I had to move the A a few times, it's actually underneath this hem, so I moved the A over to here so I could see it. I had to do that on all four corners. So it's going to fit, it was up here, it can easily be pushed down like this and you typically fits fairly well. It doesn't have to go all the way to the edges, uh, but very close to the edges. So I'm going to flip the patch over, because this is the same side as this side, I can tell. Uh, and I'm going to put double sided tape on all three sides. Three edges, I should say. Okay, then I'm going to lift up these hems here just on this corner. And I'm going to stick it in there. So, so it fits pretty, pretty good. All the way up to the top here, stick that corner down. That's nice. Then I'll put these back over the top of them. Now there's no double sided tape here because the double sided tape stuck to the sail. You can apply double sided tape inside of there again to, to pre-baste it, which I think I will. If I'm going to do it on the inside here so it doesn't get in my needle. Now we've got a corner patch. Now this top looks pretty bad up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our cerite uh, tempered cutting glass for hot knife underneath it. And then I'm going to use a hot knife and I'm going to trim this so the corner looks nice. Just like that. So we're going to do that to all the, th the uh, four corners. Three more to go. Sewing the hems, corner patches, and D-rings on with webbing is next. All right, so we're going to just start here on the side and we're going to sew about an eighth inch away from the folded edge. So I'm going to use the uh, center foot as a guide. I could put a magnetic guide on this too, but following the center foot is actually a pretty good way to do it. And I'm going to do a little bit of reversing here. And we'll just sew down this leg. Now I'm using a size number 20 needle and V92 polyester thread. And I am sewing with about a six millimeter stitch length. And I don't want to sew a short stitch length because um, that'll shrink up the side more than I'd like. Every time you sew a seam, uh, or a stitch, it shrinks up the fabric a little bit, which is expected. If you sew a really small stitch length, then it shrinks it up even more. So six millimeters is a great length. If, you can, if your machine only does five, that's okay. Just try to make it as long as you possibly can, going no more than six millimeters. This HDPE shade fabric is fairly easy to sew. We're using the Sayerite Ultrafeed LS1 sewing machine. It is the world's best portable walking foot sewing machine, period. So I'm coming to the corner, and what I will do is I'll bury my needle. I'm going to use the reverse lever a little bit to bury the needle backwards, like that. And then I'll lift my foot, I'll pivot on that needle, I don't lose my spot. I'll lower my foot. And then we just sew down the other side, no reversing necessary. We will come back and we'll sew this bottom edge after we're done doing all the hems. Putting my hand like this and my other hand back like this actually gives me great control. So I sew, then I stop, and I reposition my hands. So you sew about uh, a foot and then reposition, but you can guide the fabric nicely. All right, so here we're going to do the bottom edge. We're going to sew a little bit of reversing into the hem here. 
and then we're going to sew along this bottom edge. This edge doesn't have a hem, but it is hot knifed. And then we get into the hem and we'll reverse again there. Okay, we'll do that to all four corners. Okay, we're going to put webbing uh, on the, a D-ring on this corner, so I'm going to chop off the end, leaving about a one inch straight edge here. So from here to here, it's about one inch. Okay, we're going to cut our webbing to about eight inches using a hot knife to seal the ends of the webbing. If you use scissors, you can use a burner or a wood burning tool uh, to cut the webbing. We need four strips, so we'll cut four of these. Then at this corner, what I'm going to do is put double-sided tape about three inches down from each side. Then I'm going to take um, my eight inch webbing with a D-ring, one inch stainless steel D-ring installed in the middle of it. Peel off the transfer paper, revealing the glue, and then baste it in place. This is the uh, underside of the sail shade. And make a loop like this and baste down the opposite leg. And it's a little bit uh, short here. So what I'll do is I'll just release this one because this, this one's a little bit longer to make its leg about the same distance as the other one. There we go. That's perfect. Just like that. Now this is hanging over a teeny bit. Nice thing about double-sided tape is you can peel it up and reapply it so that it's hidden on the underside. Now it's hidden from the edges. So I'm going to sew right next to the D-ring, the bottom edge of the D-ring, as close as I possibly can. I'm not going to put a roping zipper foot on, though you could if you want to get really close to the D-ring. This is close enough. And I'm going to do a, lot, a little bit of reversing here. Whoa! Got my presser foot stuck on the webbing. That's no big deal. I think I have enough reversing there anyway. So that secures that in place. Now we still need to sew down each one of the legs. So to do that, I'm just going to put it in, in the sewing machine. Now if you want to be fancy here and do a box X stitch, you can do so. I think I'm just going to sew uh, around the perimeter of this. I'm actually going to put the machine in reverse to sew this, something I don't typically do, but it's going to work. Bury the needle and then go down this leg. Sew in reverse. Bury my needle, turn around, sew down this side, and then do some reversing. And we will do this to all of the uh, corners. Now this is not necessary, but you can use the Cerite uh, thread burner here, and you could touch the ends of your thread just to keep it looking beautiful or you can just trim it really close to the edge too with scissors now we can go to the patio and install the sunshade on to the end of the carby pole line we're going to attach a fixed snap hook Again, for quick installation of your sunshade. And we're going to create a uh, boland here as well. 
This is the line that comes out of the top of the carby pole we're attaching the snap hook on using a bowl and knot. And we'll be doing the similar thing on the house side except for using a smaller line. To attach to the house we're going to use a fixed snap hook. And what I'm going to use is an eighth inch leech line, black, it's a braided polyester. This line will be attached at the house to the eye bolts. The length of line is approximately three feet which we'll trim down later on. Here too we'll create a bowl and knot. If you'd like to review that, refer to the previous knot we just made a few seconds ago. Let's move on. Okay, so I have the sail shade laid out exactly how I want it up against the building. Remember that tag that we put in? <laughs> I can tell what side goes up against the house. Without this tag, it'd be a little bit of a struggle to do. So we have the right side up against the building and we have our eye bolts on the building. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use this long length of leech line, which is probably about three foot or so, and then we'll trim it to size a little bit later on, uh, tied on with a fixed snap hook. So the hem goes to the bottom side. We're going to run our leech line, which is about three foot in length through the D-ring. And then I'm going to hold, hold on to this end. I'm going to take the snap hook. I'm going to snap it to our eye bolt. I'm going to take this end of the line and I'm going to run it through the bottom of the eye bolt. And I'm going to draw the sail up fairly tight. I don't know what the tension should be, but I will in a little bit. So right now I'm just going to create a little knot in it just to keep it in the general position that I want. And then I'm going to draw the knot up to the bottom of the fixed eye snap hook. I like to have the pulley in line with the cleat at the bottom, so I'll roll the carby pole around until they're basically in line with each other approximately. Now I'm going to take my fixed snap hook that I have adhered to the carby pole and attach it to the sunshade. like so. Which is about there. And we can draw it tight, but before we draw it tight we want to uh, attach the second one. Now we just attach the last corner with the snap hook. We raise our carby pole to the desired height. Lock our cam lock in place and then we start to tension it. This one's pretty tight already. Probably going to loosen that one up a little bit and adjust this one. Now we're going to go to the house and start adjusting those. So we obviously need more tension here so I'm going to take out this knot and look how easy it is to tension it. Bam! I like it just about there. So again, I'm going to make one simple knot. I'm going to go over the top and then through the loop and then draw that up to the bottom. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to cut off this excess line here. But it's not super secure here. In fact, in a heavy wind this might actually come loose. That's not a bad thing. Remember, this is a temporary sail shade. You don't want this up in high winds. Okay, so now we're going to release this one, the knot we made, which is a simple just overhand knot. And we're going to draw it taut until we're happy with the appearance. That looks pretty good right there. And we're going to create a simple knot here, drawing it up to the bottom of that snapped eye hook. There we go. Nice. Very nice. I really don't need all this extra line here, but I do want to have a little bit of extra to make adjustments so I can pull on the line. So I'm just going to chop off the excess, leaving about a foot of extra line with the serrated edge hot knife, which seals the end of the rope. 
I'll do that on both sides. One thing we want to talk about is, is the uh, protective uh, coating, the clear coat on the carby poles. When you put it in a receiver like this, you can expect a few scratches on the carby pole. It's not going to hurt the integrity. It'll just give it a little bit of a used look. So you notice at the top of the carby pole, there is a strap eye here. And what that's meant for is for an adjustable webbing strap. So if you want extra rigidity and you want to make sure that your poles are safe, you can install a webbing strap. To do that, I'm going to take a measurement from basically the top of the pole all the way to where I'd want that strap to come to the ground for my situation. Your situation may be completely different. So for me, 119 inches is where I'd want to uh, make the length of my strap. Um, it'd be better if I had a second person to hold this up there, but I don't. But I, I do know that from there to where I want to attach it is about 119 inches. The Carby adjustable webbing straps are available in a kit form at Sayerite. We have a separate video showing how to sew those up. For optimal strength of the carbon fiber Carby pole, we're going to install a Carby adjustable webbing strap to the pad eye at the top. To do this, we need to release the sail shade, lower the pole so we can gain access to the pad eye here, then take our strap and connect it like that. Then we'll raise our pole to the position where we desire it, which is right about there, and lock our cam lock. And then we will not tighten up the sail shade yet. We'll come down here. I really would like to have this coming off so that it splits the sail shade in half. And that's the best place to mount it. Now, if you have to mount it off to the side like this, that's not a big deal. It's just not the optimal position. So I'm going to come off splitting the sail shade in half and mount it right about here. The Sayrite does not sell these ground anchors, but you can purchase them from Amazon and uh, from garden centers. I got quite a bit of mulch here. But once I get to the dirt below it, it'll take bite, and it has already. That's perfect. Now, this hook on the strap does not fit over this rather large bar. So I'm going to take a carabiner and I'm going to snap it on to this hook. So when you're uh, initially setting up the Carby uh, adjustable webbing strap, you'll have to have it unhooked to adjust the webbing slider. So with it unhooked, I can raise it, shortening the strap, or I can lower it lengthening the strap. And we have the sail shade attached to the carby pole up there. And we want this webbing strap to be rather loose before the sail shade gets tightened. Here you can see we need more length. So I'm going to lower the adjustable webbing strap. And here is just about perfect. Now there's not a lot of tension on this strap right now. But once we have the sail shade tightened appropriately, you'll find that there'll be a lot of uh, tension on the Carby adjustable webbing strap. Now that we have the Carby adjustable webbing strap in place, all we got to do is tighten up our sail shade via the line at the bottom. There we go. Now with the webbing straps on the carbon fiber poles, they are a lot tougher and can withstand a little bit more windage than they can without it. So if you want optimal support for your carbon fiber pole, we highly recommend purchasing the Carby adjustable webbing strap, which is a DIY kit that you have to sew. For a sunshade of this size, I recommend adding a quick pin to lock the poles in place. The cam locks always lock better in the red zone. And you can see here's the red zone here. So I like to have uh, my maximum height set to just about like that so I can just see the red zone and then I can lock the cam lock, and it's pretty secure at that position. Now, if it's not secure enough, what you can do is you can open the cam lock, and you can use an Allen key and tighten up this top bolt, and that will give it more bite. 
However, with sail shades that are rather large, like ours is, sometimes you'll find that if the fabric's heavy or if you get a rain, the carby pole will collapse on its own, mainly because it's under tension with the internal rope and it's under tension with the webbing strap when the sail shade is taut. So what we like to do is we like to drill a hole through the carby pole and insert a removable pin that's easy to remove, and we're going to show you how to do that. This is the quick pin, and it's stainless steel, and it has two ball detents on it. Uh, this is what we're going to use to lock the carby pole at the desired position, the highest position for us. So we want this cleat and the uh, pulley up here to be in line. So I'm going to line those up, and I'm also going to extend the length of the carby pole to the red position that we just discussed. So all the way up here, and the red position is just slightly peeking out of our cam lock. So now, at that position, I'm going to make sure these are in line with each other, just by eye, probably sight down the pole. Yeah, that looks good. Then I'm going to lock the cam lock in that position. And you can position this hole. I typically like to put it uh, a couple inches down from the cam lock. So I'm going to put it right here, and it's in line, again, with the pulley and the cleat at the bottom. And I'm going to start with an eighth inch drill bit, and I'm going to hold my drill as straight as possible to drill through both the internal carbon fiber and the external. Now go slowly here with this small bit, and keep your drill so that it's uh, 90 degrees to the pole. Okay, we're through one side. Now remember, there's a rope inside there, so we don't want to get the rope, and I can actually kind of feel to make sure that I'm not on top of the rope, and now I can drill through the bottom side. Now I'm going to put it over top of some of these holes in this workbench that I have. And I'm going to make sure that it looks nice and straight. There we go. And I know I'm not on top of the rope, and I'm going to drill through to the other side. There we go. Okay, so now we have a hole that goes from this side all the way to this side. And we know the position of it. So now I'm going to ream this hole out with a quarter inch drill bit. That was an eighth inch drill bit. So now I have a quarter inch drill bit, and I'm going to drill through this side. Okay, and then I'm going to turn the pole over so that we can drill through the other side at the correct spot without going through uh, the, the hole again, because I don't want to damage my rope, and I also don't want the carbon fiber to be uh, cratered outward like a mountain, but rather cratered inward. There we go. So now I can take my quick pin with the two detents on it and insert it in the pole, in the hole, and right through the other side. Now this pole will not slip. Okay, so now we're going to raise the pole to the red zone, right about there, and we can easily find that hole, see it, right there, and she's lined up. I'll lock the cam lock, just insert the quick pin. When you're done with your sail shade and you want to remove the carby pole, pull the quick pin, Release the cam lock, lower the pole. I like to snap the cam lock onto the uh, snap hook, pull it out of the receiver, and you can store the carby pole in a bag or wherever you'd like. The temporary sunshade that we can install quickly and remove quickly is now complete, and she looks excellent. Don't go away, the materials list and the tools list is coming up next. It is only through your loyal support that these free videos are made available. Thanks for your loyal support. 
and be sure to subscribe to the Sarah YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. Thanks. And here's the materials and tools list of all the items that we used to make this sunshade. If you have any questions about the materials or the hardware or any of the tools, please feel free to give us a call. We're glad to help. Showing in yellow is the quantity that we used for this shade. If you're interested in making and installing permanent sail shades rather than a temporary sail shade, click the video links here and they will direct you to tutorial videos that will show you exactly how to do that. I'm Eric Grant and from all of us here at Sailrite, thanks for watching.